Okay, welcome everyone to uh, Austin DSA's first uh, Jacobin rundown. Uh, this is going to be uh, covering the 40th of the, uh, 40th issue, and it's right after or it covers everything that happened during the winter and fall. Um, so that includes a lot of what happened during the election, um, specific to the voters, voter turnout, um, Biden and the new like Biden doctrine, and essentially what we should expect for the upcoming next four years, but also what the left response should be. Um, so these are the three main topics that we're gonna be covering, um, a left that matters. Uh, the two most important section uh, of this uh, section is elections matter and revolution after the age of revolutions. Then um, the last two sections are the indifferent and the defiant, which covers uh, the Rio Grande Valley and uh, a specific case study on an individual named Edward de Leon. And the last is the 2020 presidential election and working class voters. Um, so th this, this particular uh, cover is phenomenal. I think the art rec uh, deserves a lot of recognition. Uh, you know, our Lord and savior, uh, Joe Biden, smack dab in the middle of it with the trifecta, the big three looking down on him, HRC, Obama, Clinton, uh, his guardian angels with the, you know, the new national bird multi-million dollar drones just flying everywhere. Um, Chuck Schumer, Nancy Pelosi, uh, you know, rightly placed with Fauci and Cuomo, you know, giving it their all for, you know, the new coronavirus pandemic that arose, um, you know, this past year. Uh, we have what's now no longer fake news, but real news, MSNBC, Fox, CNN, giving us the cold hard truth. And, you know, uh, just a, a bunch of concerned allies reading white fragility, you know, in lieu of all of the craziness that's been happening. Um, and I don't know how they got it, but they got my neighbors down here who were like celebrating on the streets with fireworks. Um, but yeah, we saw a lot of interesting responses from people like Luke Skywalker, you know, that just loves Joe Biden, that, you know, that he has a pet, he has a dog, we have a dog back in the White House, and we have someone that just has a nice, great smile, you know, as he uh, imprisons a lot of Black people. Um, so the first essay uh, by Chris Maisano, uh, Left That Matters, um, so I'm going to be kind of going in reverse order. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the obstacles that the left has faced, and, um, and then what the response from large-scale uh, organizations like DSA should be, and, and sort of the left writ large. Um, so we should, we initially need to look at how politics operates in the status quo, right? So contemporary politics in America are nationalized and polarized. So the ability for independent parties, like third parties, to insert new ideological modes of political engagement and societal restructuring has been kind of chopped and closed off, you know. So absent being under a party name that's been recognized, it's hard for them to inject themselves on, an, on a national scale. And politics has also been dominated by a, a sort of neoliberal consensus, right? So although there's a distinction between the left and the right, between the Dems and the GOP, um, when you understand uh, well, that distinction sort of just collapses when you understand that politics is solely um, it solely serves to cater to corporate interests, right? So when Warren says that uh, she's against billionaire but has private meetings with a group of millionaires and billionaires to convince them, you know, that she's on their side, or when union guy Joe says he, he loves workers' rights but just distances himself from like the Amazon union, but it sort of proves that politics no longer uh, operates on a sort of left-right basis, but a sort of neoliberal basis. Um, the second uh, part of, uh, you know, a lot of the reasons why we've seen this collapse in politics is the, that the strength of mass membership organizations and unions has decreased and the obstacles uh, for them have increased since the 1980s, right? So organized labor has uh, overall declined and disintegration of working class community life has increased. So, you know, in fact, there's billions of dollars poured in to ensure that this happens like Prop 22 in California. So unfortunately, uh, this leaves a small minority of workers to participate in effective forms of collective action, which is you know, better than none, but heavily resource deprived uh, in comparison to like interest group pressure politics. Um, so what are some, like notable examples uh, of this uh, and obstacles to like 
unions and the formation of large scale movements. Um, I'm only gonna give a couple of examples. So if you have examples, you can type in the chat. Um, but first is the uh, right to work laws. And there's they're essentially like very insidious laws that prohibit union security agreements. They're framed as freedom of choice that you don't have to join a union when in reality federal law says, you know, it makes it illegal to force someone to join a union in the first place. Um, I got this from a union site, but the real purpose of right to work laws is to tilt the balance towards big corporations and further rig the system at the expense of working class families. These laws make it harder for working people to form unions and collectively bargain for better wages, benefits and working conditions. And this slimy guy, um, his name is, uh, I think, well, what is it? It's Russell Brown. Um, so in Alabama, the Amazon workers are in the process of unionizing and uh, Amazon has lost the campaign to do everything to ensure that this doesn't happen. And this is not uncommon into union sentiments and union busting is still, is still extremely prevalent. Um, but yeah, this slimy dude, Russell Brown is in charge of ensuring that um, Amazon, the Amazon union doesn't happen. And how are they doing it? Um, so multiple different ways. So right now, uh, the union is deciding if they want, or the Amazon workers are deciding if they want to be represented by the RWDSU, which is the Retail Wholesale Department uh, Store Union. Um, Amazon is forcing them to have that vote and election in person, well knowing that, you know, it's probably not going to happen because of the coronavirus. There's flyers and bathroom stalls that, um, that have infographics to why unions are dangerous to the security of a worker. Classes are held um, to delegitimize unions. Um, workers have been called up front in front of other coworkers to take photos of them and their badge, uh, which is essentially union, union suppression and intimidation tactics. Uh, and in some cases, they'll fire people, they'll increase worker surveillance to increase self-regulation, you know, and all of this isn't hard to do if you have the capital and the money to do so. So they're able to create a crisis for the worker that puts their livelihood in jeopardy and the end result is just union disruption. So it does work. Um, so those are the, like some of the main examples that, you know, parts of the left and unions and organizations have been facing. Um, so um, what should the left response be? What should DSA's response be? Um, so the answer is class struggle, right? So class formation or rather class struggle is an important and ongoing process uh, that key to build socialism and increase base expansion. So we all hear constantly like class consciousness, class struggle is key, but what exactly does that look like? Um, in two short words or two short parts, it's uh, class struggle elections, which is distinct from electoralism and labor movements. They go hand in hand. Um, so the first class struggle elections, um, using electoral campaigns to build bottom-up movements, uh, which is uniquely distinct from the top-down reformist approach, uh, that's, a view, uh, that's a view from nowhere, uh, is important. Uh, so these are distinct from campaigns steeped in like conventional electoralism, like Elizabeth Warren's or Pete Buttigieg. These bottom-up approaches are class struggle campaigns, right? So uh, these campaigns uh, have individuals that openly identify as democratic socialists and with democratic socialism, which is a very, very important distinction from traditional electoral politics. Um, these campaigns require the identification of capital and wealth accumulation as the driving force for structural inequality. But what's truly important about these campaigns is that they seek to build the movement past the campaign itself. Politics doesn't end and die with the campaign. Right, there's a quote within uh, J the Jacobin Magazine that says labor and electoral organizing can and should be mutually reinforcing. Um, so class struggle doesn't cease to exist once we have socialists in office. It ramps up aggressively to create an egalitarian organization of society. It helps cultivate class consciousness that helps us understand that the crises that we face are not personalized crises like student debt, climate change, homelessness, um, but rather an outcome of capital, right? So we know that this is just simply a result of the way that wealth and resources are being accumulated as well as a result, as well as a result of the severing of the working class from socialist organizations, which is, which is essentially an insidious project that the uh, US has been involved in for decades, including the Red, Red Scare, so on and so forth. Um, 
So what are examples of class struggle campaigns? Um, obviously, Bernie Sanders' campaign is a great one. Um, AOC to the House, thanks Chicago Socialist who won election to city council, but it also includes uh, unsuccessful campaigns um, like uh, Jovanka Beckles for California State Assembly, also the Heidi Sloan campaign. Um, so, you know, although, you know, they were unsuccessful, they were successful in the sense that they have forwarded socialism and helped build a large base of organizers and socialists. So, you know, all this is important for the visibility of socialism. Uh, as the second largest organization, a socialist organization in the history of the U.S., this gives us a pretty good chance um, to win if, you know, it's a, if it's an upward trend. Um, the second part, labor movements. Um, so what is a labor movement? It is a democratic movement that fights for the common good of the working class people. But in order to have a successful labor movement, it requires closing the gap that exists between socialist organizations such as DSA and the working class through a rank and file strategy that builds power on the shop floor level with other workers. Um, so there's no shortcuts to this process. It requires militant organizing that supports things like Chicago teacher strikes, the student debt crisis uh, strikes in Colombia, um, the like, restaurant organizing project, and super majority strikes in general, all of which help bridge that gap between socialism and the working class. Um, so I'm not going to go into detail of the rank and file strategy for um, you know just the sake of time. And um, yeah, so let's see. All that being said. Um, this is the recent trends of how people engage in politics, right? This is the main mechanism that the public mass enters politics. 2016 and 2020 elections proved that political engagement for most people is electoralism, you know, which you know can be somewhat good, in, you know, in some sense, but is vastly inefficient when it comes to socialist base expansion. So the problem that uh, you know, that this brings is that electoralism typically limits any form of radical expression. It's a very new phenomenon to say, you know, scary words like socialist, working class, comrade, etc. You know, this means that public policy is a very important and unique space to intervene in to create more favorable environments for workers and just people at large. Um, you know, I think Austin DSA has done some good work and has done good work in the past with things like the paid sick leave campaign, the homelessness decriminalization bill, getting Jose Garza into office, the Heidi campaign, so on and so forth. So all these things prove that you know large scale politics will inevitably be run through class struggle uh, like uh, elections. Um, so this uh, is a picture of a DSA, the 2019 DSA convention to kind of be in stark contrast with the image that the beginning of Jacobin poses, which is that in 2015, there was a, a, convent, a DSA convention with like a, less than 200 people in a small Christian center that got no press, no coverage. Now DSA is the second largest socialist organization that's come extremely far with people openly identifying as socialists, um, politicians openly identifying as democratic socialists. So the, the takeaway from this is that these type of strategies that the, that the left and namely DSA has been using are good, but it only can get better. Um, okay, so the second uh, essay in the first 61 pages of this uh, issue is called uh, Revolution in the Capital West. Um, so a majority of the left's base building strategies, you know, are in good faith but they remain marginal because of de facto anti-electoralism, insistence on dual power strategies, which a lot of libertarian socialists adhere to, and just inclination towards catastrophism. So uh, I can give an example of why dual power particularly is bad, because its determination to build counter institutions remain very insular, and it tries to create local economies that take on the state and capitalism, but you know, it's counterinsurgent goals to delegitimize capitalism and disrupt, you know, national econo nationalized economic tendencies uh, through, like, you know, investing over investing to local economies like food distribution, street repair, cleaning up of neglected buildings, mass demonstrations to disrupt or operations um, don't really scale up to anything. So, you know, while all these things are good in theory, um, over investment in these strategies actively trades off with mass labor organizing. Right, and so this is a libertarian socialist model 
uh, that thinks building local economies is enough to challenge power, when in reality, it's resource deprived and can't assert itself in the face of capitalism, which is why it becomes marginal, which is the key word. The second um, uh, part is that of why le the left has largely failed, especially um, in the 2020 election regarding Bernie Sanders, is that base builders seek to reject the need for class struggle electoral action, and they defer it to the future, you know, in, into like this image where millions are organized, but, you know, absent any sort of class struggle elections, that may never happen. We may never see those worlds in the first place. Um, so, you know, absent this, the left, the le leftism sort of resorts to militant particularisms where, you know, localized na narrow pattern of actions cannot be scaled up to any sort of movement. Um, so, you know, like, why would anyone uh, in the public join a party that they'd never heard of, you know, for their economic salvation? They wouldn't, which is why Marxist reformism is the only necessary way to sort of break out of these uh, method or um, what is it? militant particularisms. Um, don't know what that is. Oh. These are just a couple of funny quotes. That, um, People submitted to Jack Ben. Um, and yeah, this is Patrick. Okay, thanks for that presentation, Subu. Um, and I was thinking since there's only five people here uh, or six, uh, it, this can be a lot more of a resemble an open discussion. Well, first, I'd like to ask the question uh, like, have, have y'all read? Has everyone here read uh, these pieces? So the Megan Day one, the Chris Masano one. Okay, okay. In that case, we're good. Um, I'd like to. Okay, see the next slide. Uh, so like, as I'm talking, feel free at any time to like intervene or say something like if you'd like to make a point. But th I thought this article was uh, super fascinating. Um, she can I, can I briefly clarify with Sue with. Uh, Subu, um, is it so? You said the the second largest socialist organization. Do you mean ever in the, in the U.S.? Okay, all right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think currently it's the DSA is the biggest one. Um, so in the Rio Grande Valley, uh, in the in the south southern tip of Texas, uh, Megan Day found this guy Edward De Leon and interviewed him. Um, and this, these counties along the border, incredibly poor. Um, uh, and these, these four counties in the, in the border, which usually swing very hard for Democrats, uh, went for Biden by a, uh, by a lot narrower margins than 2016. So next slide. And the reason for that isn't because, uh, like, like, so Eduardo, like, as y'all know, he abstained from voting. He find he didn't like to be sh to be shamed by other people uh, for his uh, non-votingness because he because the reason why a lot of people in this valley voted for Trump was not because uh, out of this like weird inborn racist defect or an innate racism gene that animates Latinos and makes them go crazy, takes over their brain and forces them to uh, like bring out mega, mega flags on trucks. That's not it. The explanation is a material one. It's very, very simple, right? I, I think like the article puts it very, very clearly. In this quote, barely making ends meet, not being able to put food on the table, in the absence of any serious prospects for substantive economic relief, 2,000 checks, 1,400 checks, uh, it's been over a month, nothing's came. In, in the absence of serious relief to weather the pandemic, Eduardo says people just want their jobs back and plenty believe Trump was the one who can make it happen. So here, the primary driving force for why the why we saw the surge of support for Trump is, oh, you got you haven't gotten my six your six hundred 
a non-voter till 31. Yeah. Well, now you're a voter, like congratulations, that's sick. Uh, <laughs> before and after, right? Life is like so different when you vote. So people just wanted their jobs back. People thought Trump was the one who can make it happen, which means people voted for Trump, not because they were racist, not because he was racist, but despite him being racist, even though he was racist, he, they saw someone who was racist. They saw that he spoke to their material self-interest too. And that superseded the racism. That was more important than the racism, even as Trump was calling like people that looked like them, like Latinos, like murderers and rapists and drug traffickers, et cetera. I mean, if he's gonna bring, like make it so I can go back to and not starve, then he's better than Biden. It's a simple risk calculus. Um, so unimpressed with his options, he abstained. Next one. Um, some incredible data here from the four counties in the Valley. In 2016, Hillary won Star County by 60% over Trump. And that lead was cut by 55% in 2020, which is in, uh, just a catastrophic uh, decline in support for the Democratic Party. Uh, voted for Pete. Yeah. Yeah, that's very good. Um, you can see that with Hidalgo County, Cameroon County, Willisie County, all these where J Joe Biden just took a massive dump uh, and, and somehow managed to eke out a win in these counties that were since something like 1972, they've been voting blue. Um, not yeah, sure. but like people were saying that Texas is going to flip, but yeah. instead he barely... I mean, he didn't win Texas. Oh, okay. So let's watch this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're, yeah, yeah. People were saying Texas was going to flip, um, but I think the the counties that they were that the, that these like liberal pundits thought were going to flip were like the tend to be the more metropolitan center city centers. Like, yeah, Austin's and they gonna... they assumed that like support would hold constant in like working class like Latino areas and so on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, because they thought that, um, which I'll talk about later, that demographics somehow implies the destiny for uh, Democrats. Um, but let's play this video because it's a perfect transition. Listen, kiddo, I get it. I don't like the two party system. I think our country's corrupt. And quite frankly, I don't wanna vote for Biden. It feels like voting for a Republican, but I'm gonna do it. You wanna know why? Because the alternative is a fucking fascist. A fascist is a fascist. Maybe we can have the conversation about dismantling the two-party system when a fascist isn't running. Maybe we can do that later, kiddo. Champ. Chief. Maybe we can talk about it later. Listen, kiddo. I get it. Okay. I don't... No, please, no. <laughs> okay. So... We've all seen this heinous um, thing, but who is she talking to? Who is she talking to? She's talking to Edward. She's talking to people like Edward. In this piece, it says, in the run up to the election, liberals clucked their tongues or shrieked or whatever it is she's doing. Uh, their tongues at non-voters frequently accusing them of revealing their privilege and failing to act decisively on behalf of the less fortunate. But so she's, she's this, this tirade is directed at people like Edward. But Edward isn't privileged. This piece goes on to say he grew up poor in the valley with a disabled mom. His dad traveled all across Texas and sent back checks, whatever checks he could afford. Um, he's not, Edward is not privileged. Edward grew up poor. Uh, firmly in the working class. Um, so, so then uh, we then then I go on to talk about. I think she thinks she's talking to other folks in her very specific demographic. Yeah, the that the whole the entire demographic she's part of. Uh, like voted Biden. They're just they're just each other guilting each other into voting for Biden. 
It's very true. Um, but at the same time, this message is indirectly also just a piercing missile for poor people because uh, Edward Edward didn't. He was a conditional voter. He didn't vote because uh, he was simply disaffected. She's also that that's she's also screaming to him. She's just like an, oh, just absurd. Um, so so the, these two political scientists, Nicholas and Wolf. Um, lay out these like four different kinds of voters like I'm sure you're familiar with them the obstructed voter so I, I think the one way that the like the popular conventional media discourse tries to frame uh, how, why people don't vote as there tends to be these incredible uh, long lines these incredibly draconian voter suppression laws um, and, and and stuff like that and and while there's certainly the case um, there it, it all in total, like this, like uh, de jure segregation, just like by lawful uh, voter suppression, only comprises like maybe five percent, right? So, uh, a, a much bigger cohort of people who don't vote are conditional voters who who decide not to vote. That's uh, almost five times as bigger as the group that can't vote. Um, then the, there's the apathetic group than the incapable group who are just barred access by the demands of, of living. Um, so when, when, when the media fixates on uh, like legal uh, discrimination and voting, what they, what, they, what they presume as okay and need not to be talked about more is the conditional voters, the voters who uh, re actively have refused the, the silver platter of Democrat or Republican. The, the 26 to 25 percent of voters who say like I don't want either the media can't talk about these 25 percent of people because if they do it means that they have to go against their candidate like Joe Biden um, okay just next slide and so this one I'll make this one like a, a lot briefer so next slide it's about the, the working class politics um, interesting data uh, Good job, white men. In 2020, the exit polls for white men, it showed that they were the only uh, racial group that voted uh, less for Trump in 2020 than they did in 2016. The vote, voting shares for white men going to Trump went down 4%. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's a lot more informed. Yeah, exactly. And he says uh, he doesn't He's, he's not ashamed to disclose that he didn't vote because, I mean, he refuses the idea that he should feel shame. Um, whereas like, if you voted, you're uninformed because you think someone's looking out for your interest, right? Um, so in 2020, all the racial minorities pretty much increased their vote shares for Trump in 2020 than they did in 2016. Uh, next slide. Okay, so the one there's two takeaways. One is that the despite Democrats' appraisal of themselves as the pro-diversity, anti-white supremacy party, Joe Biden's coalition tends to be affluent white people that lives in live in suburbs, right? And what this means is that we're seeing a trend, a, a, a pivot where the GOP, at the same time that the GOP is trying to recast itself as a party of the working class, um, which is just like, you can't even do the mental hoops it takes for that to make sense. Um, at the same time they're doing that, the Democratic Party is divesting itself of its traditional working class base uh, and replacing it with uh, richer people, tend to be people who went to college and work in sectors like uh, finance, law, professorships, et cetera. Um, uh, what this means for us as uh, socialists and as members of DSA is that we don't, we, we don't purely invest in the Democratic Party and the politicians that that machine endorses because we, we know that that the Democratic Party is a black hole and that they are uh, fucked. What we, do, what we can do, however, 
is what DSA did in the 2016 and 2020, which is use electoral politics as a vehicle, as, uh, as, a, as a strategic point of entry to launder in socialist ideas, like which is what, a, which is what DSA did, right? Even if like a bunch of DSA locals that didn't explicitly work with the Sanders campaign, uh, the DSA locals still advocated for Sanders and ran campaigns for Sanders, can, canvassed for Sanders, used Sanders' platform and his pulpit in order to uh, launder in socialist analysis and socialist worldviews uh, and socialist explanations for the, the harms that we experience. And um, to that extent, we were using uh, the electoral politics as a strategic way to increase the con like so class consciousness, um, to widen our base, to to increase our capacity for the next election struggle, um, and to just get more experience for the next election struggle. Um, the next one. Um, the second takeaway being that oh yeah, working class voters working class voters shifted to the right across all racial groups. And the right continued to lose wealthy suburbs. <laughs> they, they lost wealthy suburbs, but made inroads in working class counties. The implications are important and twofold. The first being that demographics is not uh, destiny. And uh, the, the browning of America the the mixed the increasing mixture of of America uh, does not translate into a leftward shift in American politics. On the contrary, it's possible that the browning of America can also correlate with a rightward swing in politics, right? Because um, even if you're even if you're if you're black if you're a Latino. Uh, if you're Asian, you st before, even if uh, like you're uh, like a racial minority and you're increasing your presence in like corporation boardrooms and such, um, that does not build, that does not do anything to build a left socialist movement. Um, the second point being that a politics that is dependent on further sedimenting the sedimenting um, the realness of like identity differences um, and based on meeting diversity quotas uh, can't build a mass working class coalition. And one case example here, I think, is the uh, the case made for reparations versus the case made for Medicare for all. If, med if reparations is a policy that only benefits a singular racial mind, uh, group of people, namely, let's say black people, then what incentive do I have or does Kyle have or does Ashkan or Subur John have to be invested in the reparations program? Because I certainly don't have any. To the extent I do, it's animated by some personal guilt, some personal uh, desire for the rectification of slavery, right? Uh, the, the wealth that was pillaged from slaves. But for me, it, it, if, I, if my case for reparations is not tied to my self-interest, it's tied to my, like a, some, some self like sense of guilt that I want uh, like black people to have more money from like the US treasury. Okay, that's not how we build a mass co working class coalition though. If uh, like reparations targets and benefits only a specific stratum of people, then everyone outside of that stratum can't be depended on to like push for reparations because it doesn't benefit them. That, that's not a, I don't think that's a controversial thing. I think that's simply